Hello everyone, I'm High Treason. We're going to have a look at how the Mullet Men Sega Mega Drive video was made. Which, well, I'm going to have a go at doing it without a script. Let's uh, let's try this, this might not get used. But, obviously if we're going to make a video, we are going to need a video camera. Technically we can make a video without one, but, well, it won't quite have the same effect. And so, naturally I chose the Panasonic NV-M5 VHS movie, which is a VHS camcorder, who would have thought. It's a little older than the rest of the hardware, it seems to be from around 1986, and it really is the baby of its range feature-wise, but it's capable and it's the right sort of technology, in that it's VHS. Although, to the best of my knowledge, that wasn't actually the preferred format, and I didn't really know anybody other than my dad who used VHS, certainly not at the start of the 1990s, everything was on uh, Video 8 or whatever by then, so yeah, I, VHS is quite big and bulky, although I do like the form factor of this camera, I'd quite like to get a modern digital one like this at some point, a lot easier to use. Now, this thing is heavy, it weighs about 5 kilos fully loaded, which is the upper limit for the tripod. The tripod's going to need a counterweight on the hook at the bottom to stop it from tipping over. So we have a bag with a bunch of 2 litre water bottles in it. We've got a counterweight of about 7 kilos, all things considered, and I wouldn't want to do this to the tripod all the time because it will probably put some serious wear on it and, well, it might fall to bits and destroy the camera. The camera itself is actually quite user-friendly. It would allow for an external microphone port. It has controls on it that really you'd expect to find. They're not that dissimilar to a modern camera. It has a viewfinder, which is using a tiny little CRT. It's monochrome only, though, and you can lift it to look at it without putting your eye up against the glass, but you can't really see it that well from a distance. There's some LED indicators in there to tell you if it's recording and such, but what we had to do is hook it up to a Sony broadcast monitor. Now, as it happens, the camera has uh, a BNC connectors, which are on the power brick of all places, for audio and video to be passed out of the camera, and it has zero latency, so that was very usable, and it does output in colour. I didn't bother hooking the audio up, Incidentally, this model of camera, you can actually input video through use of an adapter, so you could use this thing as a regular VCR, and it does have all the controls for that. However, it will only play and record in standard play, so you won't be using long play and extended play modes on it. There's just no need to implement them, really, I suppose, and standard play is going to give you the best quality. We need to build a set. And we did that with relative ease, using a black sheet, a lot of drawing pins, some Christmas lights behind it, and some electroluminescent tape for extra tackiness. It looks a bit crap, in all honesty, but, well, it suits Mullet Man, and he seems to like it, so we'll leave that as it is. The Mega Drive's actually propped up on a chair and a bunch of cardboard boxes with more black sheet over the top. The only issue is that this camera, whilst it does have settings for white balance and exposure and focus and such, is having to film indoors, and that's technically a low light condition, which means that we have to blast everything with lots and lots of halogen lights to make them show up at all, and I don't quite have enough lights. However, that might be a good thing, as the level of light that this is giving off is quite blinding to be honest, and it was starting to hurt my head towards the end. Now with all the video done, we're going to have to digitise it into the computer, and naturally I chose the Pentium 66 as it's essentially what I would have built when it was a relevant system if I'd been building one at the time and money was no object. Now. You might actually start realising at this point that I, I've been trying to make this thing into a video workstation for quite a long time. It's all coming together now, isn't it? It's essentially the great-grandmother of my current day Xeon, I suppose. Very similar in uh, principle and what's in there and what it can do. Now, we already know about the capture card and it has its own video, so I'm not really going to go over the technicalities of that too much. However, we'd need something to get video into that capture card. We could get it straight out of the camera using those BNC connectors, 
but for the best possible quality I'm going to use the Panasonic AG5700 with the S-Video. Now S-Video is probably not going to make that much of a difference in this case because we're going to be recording to 320 by 240 at 15 frames a second with 11 kilohertz audio. It's unfortunate but this is a thing with all the machines where you have to find this fine balance. We could compress the video more but we just don't have the power so there's no codec on the card to do that. Yeah the aura compression we're using is done on the card and it is then decompressed and decoded by the capture card as well. It actually displays the video player back in the same way it does an incoming video signal by overlaying it onto the VGA signal that it's receiving from the graphics card. And there's the, and there's the issue with the balance. How much of this can you do in hardware and how much can you do in software? You need the files to be small and you need the stream coming out of the card to be able to fit within the bandwidth limits of the ISA bus which is barely more than 8 megabytes per second. However, the more you compress it, the more power you need to compress it and decompress it and we don't have that much power in a machine from this long ago. It's a bit of an art form to get in the balance right, however I think we've probably found a, an acceptable trade-off here with the resolution, frame rate and the audio quality that we're using. Bit of a stumble, that happens when you don't use a script. Now, we've got the video digitised and it does look quite grainy, however I'd like to point out to you that it's not actually that bad and the Panasonic NVM5 is a really capable camera for its time. Here's some of that footage digitised using a modern day capture card. And as you can see, the quality is really there, especially shots where manual focus was used. They're really, really sharp. There's no problem reading that text at all. Now, the macro shots were particularly challenging to do because the tripod had to be used in a very specific way, basically upside down, and I don't think there are many tripods that do this. Uh, this was right on the limits of what this tripod can hold steady, and uh, the mechanism was starting to move if I let go of the camera and getting the light in was quite difficult just because of the sheer size of the camera however it performed perfectly and well the tape turned out fine we're digitizing it just fine now the tapes we used are 3M professional tapes they're only 60 minutes long you could get longer ones these had never been used we only needed one of them with all the video digitized we've made some graphics in New Lead Media Studio which I did almost use to do editing and it's quite interesting to note that New Lead Media Studio at the time was comparative in features to professional products like Adobe Premiere. In fact some of it's easier to use such as the chroma keying and it makes you wonder if New Lead hadn't consumerized and dumbed down the interface what would have happened if they'd continued on this path. We might have been talking about you lead media studio instead of Premiere and Vegas today but well I guess we'll never know it probably wouldn't have done because it didn't seem to gain as much traction but would they have done that's the question probably not still we're going to use Premiere 4.0 instead and there is a bit of an issue here in that to work with it more easily I've turned up the desktop resolution to 800 by 600 the thing is, acceleration on the Diamond Stealth VGA card I use is pretty much disabled at this speed, uh, at this resolution, so we're going to get some performance hits. However, the CPU, whilst it is having to do pretty much all of the work, is doing just fine, at least for now. There are only a few megabytes left on the hard drive though, and they're going to be rapidly eaten by paging as the project grows. The other issue we've got is Premiere seems to read some of these files a bit strangely where the audio gets a bit squashed up and goes out of sync. There's really not much I can do about it. Uh, I'd have to capture the files in a different format and they would look worse. I could sync them but it would have taken just far too much work. The project wouldn't have been done on time and it honestly didn't seem like it was worth putting that much effort in. I wanted production to be a little bit shoddy because let's face it, it's Mullet Man. He probably wouldn't be that good at these things. Still, editing goes along just fine. Nothing goes seriously wrong. We do have one crash at one time, but that's a graceful one. We simply ran out of memory because I'd forgotten to turn some things off. And it was very quickly corrected and no harm was done. As time moves on though, it does get slower. Well, there's 
obviously more and more memory being eaten up, there are more and more files having to be opened and closed by the editing application. And editing on the timeline isn't that much different to a modern editor, it really is about that. You would be able to figure this out pretty quickly if you're familiar with video editing. But it's still going fine, aside from this problem my frame buffer has developed. This appears to be a physical issue, I think one of the joints has gone dry for the video RAM. So we can probably fix it with a hot air gun or a soldering iron. It doesn't seem to be anything serious, I've seen it happen before, but it's quite distracting when I'm trying to work. Nonetheless, we've got all the audio dubbed in, we've got all the effects done, we've got transitions, we've got chroma keying, we've got audio envelopes, there are no VU meters, so we have to do that by ear or use external meters. We had to do it by ear here, so I'm sorry for anything that's deafening in that video. And well, we're pretty much done. Now what? Well, we've got to render the video, but that's another hard linen of itself because, well, we don't have any space left on the hard drive. So what are we going to do? Render it to a network. Yeah, we can certainly render it to a network. I have a shared volume that's 32 gigabytes in size. The only issue is that Premiere 4.0 is largely 16-bit and also the operating system can only handle FAT16 volumes. It doesn't care about this when it's on the other end of a network. There are certain compatibility measures in place. The most visible, noticeable manifestation of this is how file names are truncated down to 8.3 instead of long file names. However, all the other limits are still imposed. We can't create a file that's larger than 2 gigabytes. If you're wondering how Premiere would handle this uh, condition, it would think the disk was full. Now this is an issue because to get the best quality and the fastest render, assuming the network has the bandwidth to do it, we'd render without any compression at all, with there enough the same settings as the source media. So 320 by 240 with 11 kilohertz audio at 15 frames a second. It would render quite quickly in theory because not a lot of processing has to be done aside from the effects and video mixing, etc. However, rendering uncompressed is going to use up that 2 gigabyte limit way too fast and the only way we could do it is to render multiple files. And I don't want to do that, I want the final render to be done on this Pentium 66, which means we're going to have to use some form of compression. Now, one of the first options we could look at, and very common at the time, is Microsoft Video One, which was originally made by MediaVision, who made the sound card in this thing. The only issue is, it doesn't look that good, because it's an old vector quantization engine. Now, it has advantages in that it's very quick, it uses very little power, so we could render a very small file in probably a couple of hours using this codec, but it's not a good candidate and I'm not pleased with the idea of the quality that it would output. So instead I look at Cinepak, which is a very similar codec. Now, Cinepak gets around, you could use this on Apple computers, and it was even used on the Sega CD as far as I'm aware, but it's vector quantization like Video One, and, well, let's face it, we don't want that. We already know that's not good enough. The alternative is Intel Indio, now, India requires a lot more power to encode, it will take a lot longer, but it doesn't need a lot of power to decode on the other end. It should produce a relatively small file, at least compared to not compressing things. So we're going to use India with the quality slider up to 100%, and just not compress the audio at all. That's going to be raw PCM, and it should get us within the limits, but still get some pretty good quality, and good being subjective. It should be viewable, at least. Of course, the issue is that rendering in Intel Indio is going to take about 10 hours. It's probably twice as quick as it would be on a, an equivalently clocked 486, if not more. The Pentium is actually very good at this kind of job compared to the CPUs which came before it. Although, people would think you were a bit balmy at the time. Video editing on X86 was still a bit alien, really. People weren't doing it yet. It hadn't gained that much traction, so you'd probably get some funny looks. Still, there's not much point trying to build up tension. I mean, there are some risks. I'm going to have to go to sleep while this render's going on, and as we've established in the past, these older operating systems don't use a hardware extraction layer, or HAL, as you might call them. 
And so, if something goes wrong, yeah, we do have advantages with the direct hardware access. It's faster, it's, it's more simplistic, you don't need that much power. On the other hand, there's no protection in place, so anything could overflow and the machine might spend nine hours corrupting its own hard drive, and we wouldn't know until we woke up. There's just nothing in place to stop it. However, I'm not being cocky. I built this machine. I know what it'll do, and I know what I can get away with, and I think it's going to be absolutely fine. It's certainly not going to blow up or anything, and naturally it doesn't. There is a render waiting for me when I wake up, and it's absolutely fine, basically. There's no need to go back and change anything, except I made a typo, so I have to go back and change things and spend another ten hours rendering things. So the machine's worked its butt off. However, it goes to show that these things are capable. These machines aren't geriatric museum pieces, they are built to do actual work, and when tasked with such work, they'll pull through, they will get there. There's certainly nothing to stop you making a project at a higher resolution, but it's finding that balance, and in this case, largely limits of the IS Airbus when capturing. There's just no point in upscaling it, it'd probably look worse. Now, with the render complete, we just had to upload it to the internet, which unfortunately wasn't possible to do on this machine, but still, that was it. We got it done. Somebody's probably looking at the CGI, like the logos uh, that have some 3D or lighting, like my logo or the Channel 6 logo, and thinking that I've cheated, and you'd be quite right, those were rendered on a modern machine. However, this isn't actually inaccurate, because if you were making a television show at the time, as in legitimately working in a television studio, these would almost certainly not have been rendered in-house. In fact, Triple I would probably have been contracted, or a similar company. So they made uh, the logo animations for networks like CBS in the 70s and 80s, so usually you would outsource things like that probably to an external company, they'd use a more powerful mini-computer like a PDP-11. Later on they moved to using SGI workstations. Uh, the BBC and Channel 4, they outsourced their work to somebody else, I don't remember his name, I'll put that down in the description. So those weren't done in-house. TV studios never did things like that in-house, or if they did it was extremely rare. In fact the Channel 4 logo was uh, quite notable in its time, it was seen as being a bit state-of-the-art. You can probably see where Channel 6 got its ideas from, but there we go, that's basically it. That's that project done. Wasn't really all that complicated, all things considered. The machine that it was made with was immensely. There's a lot of wiring going on in there, and a lot of oversized peripherals that do weird things, but that's just the nature of the beast at that time. I said I'd do a making of, and there we go. That's how it was made. That was basically everything that went into it, aside from a lot of yelling and swearing behind the scenes that you don't need to see. I mean, you can probably imagine it quite well. It wasn't actually that much of an issue, to be honest. Things went quite smoothly. I was, uh... I wouldn't say I was surprised. I did expect something would go wrong, but... I didn't think the machine would have any great difficulty with this. There's just no reason that it would. As I said, they were built to do actual work. They're not built to just look nice or something. It's just as well, because a lot of them look wonderfully ugly. They were built to do actual hard work. It isn't anything to this machine to sit there and do this for ten hours. That's a mere bump in the road. And so, there we go. Essentially my Xeon's great-great-grandmother or whatever, doing the same kind of job. And this is how you would have done it back then if there was such a thing as YouTube. I guess you would have had to distribute on a CD or a VHS tape. There were definitely CDs that came with magazines which had videos on, but I don't really remember them ever exceeding two or three minutes. In fact, many of them were only a few seconds long. I think Cinepak was probably the more common codec for them, largely due to wider compatibility. But hey, that was just the way things were, so yeah, most of them were mere seconds. Fifteen minutes, I think, or was it twelve minutes we came somewhere? No, it was more than ten. Is uh, probably stretching things a bit for that time, but I mean, look at the file size. Anyways, I think that's it. Uh, I don't really have anything else to say about this project. I said I would show you, 
I've shown you. I hope somebody out there found this interesting, but if not, well, maybe you'll find something else interesting. I'm going to go and work on that Pentium 2 video and some other stuff again now. And plus the fact, I've just talked non-stop while standing here for quite a length of time. Probably missaid some things and had to cut them out when cutting away to other shots and hoping nobody would notice. And I feel rather light-headed. So <laughs> I'm going to go and sit down. I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and as always remember, the screw up, the DOS 622 up. Because it sure worked in this case, didn't it? It's, they're not empty words.